like I was telling him, it, it's awesome to see FFA here. Uh, won't go into a whole lot. They pretty much covered all of it. Uh, all I can say is, being in Coffee County, and working with producers, I have it's just been it's been a blessed place. It's been a blessed place for me to learn, and and I'm really all I do is just learn from there. We just learn together, and I'm the big black mouth that runs around talking about it. But a couple of years ago, there were some folks going to put on a field day up in Lewis, Washington County. Iowa, and they were kind of advertising it, and it turned into one of these, you know, it can't be done here, it won't work here, you know, the sun don't shine right, and I just kind of made a post on there, and uh, ended up, a lot of folks reached out to me on this post, and I thought, well, maybe there's more into it than what I thought, so I thought I'd turn it into a talk, this may go over like a lead balloon, but I'm going to read this real quick, just to kind of set the context. So I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to weigh in here for the sayers and naysayers. First of all, kudos to the Washington County folks. Good job, guys. Folks, it's not about tillage, no tillage, tile drainage, one side of the county highway versus the other, or cover crops. It's about understanding how the resource was designed to function, and hence the worst design. This is vastly different to how you want to make it function. Now, as far as... Well, this work versus not work lies with only two, and hear me loud and clear, two principles. The first principle lies in the driving force behind all this, the sun. I'll let each of y'all decide this factor. It's multiple choice, but you have to decide whether or not the sun does or does not shine on the field you farm. If it does not, then there's no point in reading this any further. <laughs> there's probably no sense in sitting through the rest of this talk. If you have decided that the sun shines on your field, then you'll be led to study and understand the functions of the resource in which the sun plays a major role. You'll begin to understand without a living plan on the resource, the resource cannot function as it was designed. Also, along this contextual journey, you'll begin to feel a hunger in your soul, not, not your soul, but your soul, to quit trying to shove a square peg into a round hole. With enough force, we can shove that square peg but it comes with negative consequences. Folks, with enough force, we can farm the way we always have, but it will come with consequences, none of which are very positive. However, there are many folks across this country who are truly understanding how our resource is designed to function and how they can work with and enhance these natural functions of the resource and still grow crops. With this understanding, they are working towards the ability to be able to grow more, grow with less cost, and even grow a higher quality product. They fill the bins in good years, dry years, wet years, and all the years that fall in between. They can do this in Tennessee, Ohio, Canada, Oklahoma, and every square inch of Iowa. And anywhere else the sun shines on the soil. It's not because of no-till. It's not because of cover crops. It's not because of inherent soil properties. It is because they're understanding of how the soil is designed to function. They understand the context are very dynamic in their management. Some of these people are brilliant, but most are just like me. They have enough gumption to understand and accept you can't shove a square peg into a round hole. See where this went wrong for many and many folks is that you just started planting cover crops without having any understanding of your why. No understanding of how your resource was designed to function and how you can manage your operation in nature's image. It can be compared to if your wife was to raise a child to play in the majors. You had the baby, but never brought him a glove, never signed him up for Little League, never invested in lessons. You just thought the silver bullet to having a major leaguer was to have a baby. See, if it didn't work out, it was the child to blame. Same way with your farm. If you planted covers and it didn't work out, the covers were to blame. It takes two things to rejuvenate your farm, the sun and you. Most all other problems lay in between our ears. So that's the context for this talk. And it boils down to the rejuvenation of our resource does not start with the implementation of principles, but, what, but rather with our commitment to understanding ecological functions. We have to understand our why before we ever think about how we're going to do something. So why, when you look it up in the dictionary, the cause, reason, or purpose for which you know why you did it, that is why you did it. That's a mouthful. The way I think, anytime you've got to use the word that you're defining twice in the definition, that's pretty complicated stuff, ain't it? All right? 
See, so the why is complicated. How is pretty simple. Here's where I chased my passion. Right there in Coffee County. And with inside that little yellow line right there is some good inherent soil. Big time road cropping. Little special place in Tennessee. Everything that surrounds us is a rock pile, but we just, I don't know what happened in the creation. But that's what happened. And just, you know, that's where we're at. Nashville's over here. There's where Elvis was from. Up here in Knoxville, that's where we're finally starting to play a little football again. Alright? And that's, that's where we're at. I got about 53,000 acres of cropland in the county, and we're averaging about 35,000 of it in the, in the covers over the last few years. And about 25,000 of that, we're managing some biomass on. Here's what I've learned over the journey. There ain't no silver bullet in this farming stuff. All right? If you want a silver bullet, they'll have them. That's what I, I'm holding you between a silver bullet, okay, right now. But I really do think that's where it lies in our mind. That's where the silver bullet lies. There's a lot of silver bullets going on in this conference. And what we're seeing is some bright minds expressing what they're doing for us to learn from. Now, everybody's seen all these principles. You know, here's the house. And I used to always say, you got to understand your context. And I still think that is probably one of the driving principles. But I'm not too sure the most driving principle is that our integrity is going to equal the outcome. All right? I think that may be number one. That's the new number one on my list. Because... What is the most important tool to rejuvenate? And folks, we ain't talking about rejuvenating our fields. We're talking about rejuvenating our nation, communities, homes. It's, it's a lot bigger than that field. Folks, you can dig all the holes you want, but if you don't know why you're digging, right there is the most important tool that we've got in this whole thing, in my opinion. It's what I've learned over the last few years. There's the most important tool. So back home, we all shared the same whys, but our hows were a lot different, yet success was abundant. And this ain't a geographical phenomenon. It's like this all over the place, right? How many of you here are from Coffee County, Tennessee? Okay. How many of you are finding some success in these systems? Okay. So I got the, you know, why, why, why? So I about, from my standpoint, as where I work from, I got to really looking at what our resource concerns were. Identifying what's our true resource concerns, not a checklist from NRCS. What's our resource concerns? But more importantly, why are they still existing? And here's how I kind of started looking at my world. All right? We've got, this is where we came from. All right? There ain't no problem with that. A lot of heritage. I, I mean, there's no more... Nobody has more appreciation for this than me, okay? And this is where we thought success was. And don't get me wrong, it's a lot better. But folks, I had sent folks out of my office thinking I was successful because you are now only losing three tons of topsoil a year. And that's sustainable. Says it right there in the paper. And, and my mindset, well, my context was wrong, okay? We've had it wrong for so long. But it's all the same resource. But look what we can make out of it. Now, I'm not there yet, but we're heading in that direction. Okay? I have a mindset of, yes, conservation is good, but I guess just I'm a little bullheaded. Why do I want to conserve a degraded resource when there's other options? See, that's the beauty of why we're at this conference. There is other options. Also had to change another, another why. I've been trained to think in cycles. I no longer try to think in cycles. Cycles are designed to be broken. That's a big change for me. Now I try to think in flows. Flows of energy, flows of nutrients, flows of life. Because the flow may be high sometimes and it may be low. But we've all, but it's not broke. We've always still got a little bit going on. Does that make sense? So I got to look at just what does our soul need to function? So if you Google it, ain't no wonder we don't know. It ain't even on Google. <laughs> you Google it up there, and it just tells you what the soul is, what functions the soul's supposed to do. 
So it ain't, I mean, it's, it's a myth. And why is it so obvious that we can look at any living critter and understand what it takes to make it function? Humans, cows, Sasquatches, even the state bird of Alabama, you can look at that and decide what it needs to function because it's a living critter, right? But what if I show you that? Because what's it got to have to function? Folks, it's real simple. Now there's a lot of things that will enhance functions, but we got to feed it, we got to water it, and it's got to have a stable address. It's that simple. Okay? Why was my soul not fed? Why did it not have a stable address? Why was it thirsty? There's a difference between problems and symptoms. I'd always address symptoms instead of fixing problems. The problem is the sun shines, but I ain't got nothing out there to capture it, right? What's the symptom? It's starved. It's naked. That's the problem. <coughs> Why? Because of erosion. Then it's naked and thirsty. Infiltration. Compaction is not a problem. Compaction is a symptom of the problem. The problem is we have no aggregation. It's just a little different way of looking. And why did I not have any diversity? Because I grew five things. All right? For 40 years. Ever since, I mean, we've been no tilling there since Smokey Dick was a sardine. <laughs> For five years, it's all grown. Or 40 years, I mean. And what is our, how do we think about our farms? It's all segregated, right? What is our farm supposed to be? A functioning system that's got a purpose, correct? So you take all 648 parts of that car, put them all together on there, torque it perfect, and leave off the right front car. How well is your system going to function? You're going to be on a YouTube video, right? <laughs> it's just, but guys, there's 546, we got 545 of them perfect. But it still ain't working. Same way with our farms. It's all got to be there. Why? Because when we get this sucker functioning, we have a resilient resource. It's good. Good, 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 good. It ain't perfect, but it's good. Okay? And I'll settle for good. When I got a lot of goods, that's better than one great and three or four okays. It's functioning. And we know these systems contain all this stuff, right? Now the buzzword, how do we predict it? Well, let's just look at it a different way. What drives availability? The biology, both population and health, their climate, above and below ground, right? Now, we can't predict all these factors, right? But what can we do with our silver bullet? We can manage to make these good under all climatic conditions. When it's dry, it's not going to be as good, but it's going to be as good as we can make it. When it's sopping wet, it ain't going to be great, right? But it's going to be a lot better than if it wasn't. So that's how I think about things. And what does it look like when you get something resilient? These two fields right here was cleared in 1940. The Holy Grail and the Green Bee. They stayed in grass until 1970. All right? In 1970, the green bean field went into production. So what did we do in 1970? We put the iron to it, right? Holy Grail field stayed in grass with cattle on it. Now, I'm not talking rotational grazing system, all right? It, it had a fence around it that kept the cows in most of the time, and they lived out there, all right? But this thing saw iron in until about the mid-80s. Then it went into no-till. This one here stayed in grass until 11, and what do we do when we bring something out of grass? You don't till it. That was the big day deal. We started planting covers and putting it in a corn bean rotation. 
and then for two years it had you know enhanced no-till then it went in to re regenerative stuff all right what does it look like this is the one right here that i thought man we got a chance we got a chance down here in my neck of the woods to build some resiliency so in 14 perfect growing condition it don't get no better green bean field now everything i'm going to talk to y'all about is dry land corn okay everything i've got is irrigated by god okay 230 bushel corn, 283 average. We pulled a 315 NCGA off of it. It's pretty good corn. 15, it was dry. Not a drought, it was dry. 13 bushels spread on beans. In 16, this is what was really impressive. <coughs> this thing set through a D4 drought. 60 days above 90 degrees. No water, four inches of water throughout the whole grow, corn growing season. Look at the spread right here. 2017 it was wet, 20 bushel beans, and then 2018 it, it was real wet. I don't know how wet it was, but it was just a lot wetter than it was a year before. All right. So, but still look, look at the difference right here. And this is after we've been this thing we've been seeing covers for four or five years. It still ain't got there. But folks, what does that mean? All right. Oh, in 17, 18 we averaged two tenths a, a day for two years. All right, it's a lot of rain. All right, that is resiliency. Okay, some years gonna be better than others, but was there any of them years right there that we did get to fill the bins? All right, and then I got me thinking, why? What if? What are we the best at growing around this neck of the woods? My neck of the woods, your all's neck of the woods. If we combine it all, corn, beans, maters, taters, watermelons, put it all together, as a nation, we do about 516 million tons. So who thinks corn's king, beans are king, wheat, most advanced nation in the world, best thing we can, here's what we're best at still, soil, that's our number one export. There's a problem with that because there is a different way, all right? And then I got to thinking, well, man, how long we've we been working on this stuff? How hard is this to fix? And I got to look at these fellers, and believe it or not, I have nobody I can to you ever been to the moon or worked for NASA? All right? So I had to look this up. If we went outside right now and looked at that big old blue ball of cheese and I said, Thompson, let's get up there on it. That ain't a snowball chance, this fella. He's going to figure out how to do that, right? All right? But in 11 years, in 11 years, we could have planted beans on that son of a gun if we wanted to. We've been working on this for 80. How good a job have we done? Folks, this ain't the dirty 30s. That ain't what it looked like out there. That, that could have been any, any day you wanted it to be over the last few years. All right? Comes to the point where you got to look in that mirror. Whether or not, I don't care what you want to call it, but we're not going to have to quit being miners. We mined it to death. All right? All right, my son, Brady Darty, when he is nine, we got talking about soil health. I got to train him a little bit. And don't get me wrong, he's probably a little bit more brainwashed than most nine-year-olds. All right? But I asked him, I said, son, what is this soil health stuff I'm talking about? He said, well, that's pretty simple. Sun shines on the plant. Plant absorbs the sunshine, leaks sugars down in the ground, gives off a little bit of oxygen, and feeds bugs. Then the bugs feed the plant. Pretty much it, ain't it? And then I said that, or I said, Brady, what happens if the plan ain't there? I said, Dad, it won't work. <laughs> now, folks, I'm not telling you you have to accept it. But if Brady Darty at nine can understand it, I think we can too. Why is the commonality? We're all farming some level of degradation, right? Some's worse than others. But it all, all your cars got. We, we can rejuvenate them all, right? But here's the problem. We cannot go in the right direction if you're in denial. Okay? Can't be in denial of your wives. And here's just some cats. They understand share the same wise. These fellas over here on the right, that's some of my rock stars. Y'all don't know them. They got her going on. This cat right here. 
five, six tillage patches in a year and you're restoring a resource, you think that knucklehead don't have a good understanding of his wives? If everybody across the nation has forgot as much as he did, we probably wouldn't be in a lot of the problems we are. you got to learn from that. Okay? The how's easy. This is the easy part. All you got to do is understand how the soil is designed to function and start implementing the management which promotes these functions while weaning off the ones that degrade. But here's something else we got to do. We've got to simultaneously at least maintain our bottom line all right? It'd be real easy. We all just wanted to go broke doing it. So we got to find that middle line, don't we? Okay? Here's all the principles. This is all you got to do. So let me flavor it my way a little bit. You got to keep the soil covered. To some degree. We've got to protect this house. We've got to have a roof on it. Now there's some specialty stuff. But let's just talk mainstream. Let's get this. Let's get the big, the big players fixed first. Then we'll start worrying about some others. Is, is that fair enough? Living plants. It's the only thing that captures the energy source. You gotta have energy. Pump diversity. I'm not saying you have to understand it all, because I can't. But I accept nature's synergistic ways. All right. And then for years it's always been what? Minimize or eliminate tillage. Ain't that the way it's always been? I don't really like that. I think we need to understand what tillage does. Okay? Start thinking of why. What does tillage do? But then think about what do you have to do to restore those effects. Then once you start thinking about it that way, if you truly want to understand what tillage does, most of the time you can eliminate it, right? And then we throw livestock or mimical. Okay? That's kind of how I look at it. Y'all are all going to do this with a bunch of tools and materials. Y'all got them, right? Tractors, drills, and plants, they're nothing but tools and materials, correct? It's your choice what you want to build. <laughs> all right? That's where the rubber meets the road, ain't it? And then you got to get thick skin, and you got to have some skin in the game. Same day, less than a half mile apart, this guy, I, I ticked him off a little bit. Happened to, he stopped while I was taking a picture of this. He said, man, I, I'd give anything for a drink of water right now. I said, I don't know why. You wasted the last ones. <laughs> okay. He's now blank covers. He's now in it. Was mad. Here's how we've done it back home. Okay, this is how we done it. I'll say this is how you all are going to do it. The principles will remain the same, but I'm just going to take you down a little journey of how we done it. We started in low biomass, got scared of it, and smoked it. Okay, started enhancing our no-till fields. All right. Oops. Boy, oh, you're missing once. It's over. All right, so here we are, you know, starting out. There is no need for a crop roller. The only benefit we may be getting out of that, we might kill a bull, get lucky, and run over a skunk. But, <laughs> but that just to show you, you know, right there is where we started. And that was a big deal for us. The only problems you'll have with that is, you know, if the tractor don't start. Okay? So that was good, but see, it didn't, it didn't fix all my lives, right? If you go back to the problems I had, do I still have a lot of the same symptoms? It was a good start. It is better than standalone no-till. We had done a lot of good things. Learn this real quick. All right, it's hard to rejuvenate when you still plant by the calendar. And there is this peer pressure stuff in farming, but it ain't for real. <laughs> All right, so in the next year, we moved in a little bit more, okay? Very good design. Very good design system right there. Got enough stuff there to make a roof. All right, so we, we thought we are in high cotton there. But see, I'm not really mimicking nature as good as I can with some of that standing carbon. I can do a better job in my area on managing the resource there. This is still good, all right? If we grade that under the two, I'll give this one a solid six, okay? But we can do better. 
same day, just a little change. You ain't got to have crop rollers. This in here just happened to be a good video. All right, but look at that. Man, that's perfect for corn in my neck of the woods. That is perfect, all right? So we started moving that, but look what it got me. Now I'm starting to fix some problems, right? Now I'm giving myself a chance, all right? So if you do that, you know, that's the way humans work, right? If a little bit's good, then more's better. So this is one of my fields. I do kind of have a philosophy early on starting out is I will, I'll fail before I let you fail on the same thing. I'm not saying we ain't going to fail, but I'm going to strike out first. So anyways, not a problem right there. Plant. Probably didn't have to have a roller right there. We probably could have planted into a green. All right, so if that was good, right across my fence row, that's even better. Okay? Same mix was planted. Sometimes crazy stuff happens. This thing was eat up with veg. If we wanted to plant that, we could run maybe 50 foot. All right? And then you wouldn't, you don't realize how much stuff can wrap. Okay? So sometimes you got to manage different. It's a brand new roller that we got at the district that we got for farmers to use. All right? Had 30 or 40 people out there. I ran it about 50 foot right at first and wrapped some of the gun up. But by the time we got done with this, if you look back there, we ran six Sasquatches out of this field. <laughs> but that looks kind of intimidating. All right, there's one of them. All right. But see, that don't look near as intimidating, does it? That looks kind of manageable. That takes, this will reduce your stress level, okay? Trust me. And here's the start, and successful planting, folks, is not just going through a field and not cussing and not tangling up your planter, okay? We actually want to grow what we're planting, okay? There's the start of beans, okay? That's the start of 80 bushel beans with a burn down. Pretty good beans. We can make money at 80 bushels with no post applications, okay? So then we got to going into this, all right, planting corn. All right, there, that is not thick. That's not a lot of biomass. And this stuff here, that's not rapid. All right, that's just just depositing residue across your field in a different way. But see, <laughs> now that may look tall, but it's not thick. But however, our hybrids, I don't want my corn starting out in that. I don't want it competing for sunlight in that. I don't want that habitat created for the southern prairie bowl. So then we got to come in after planting and follow it. I don't know if this is the world's largest crop roller, but I know it's the heaviest. When we first started rolling with this thing, they would, you know, the Richter scale people, they thought they had a little small earthquake down there. Because that thing, I mean, you can tell when it went down the road, it just leaves a, you know, when it, even in transport, it weighs like 98 tons. All right. Anyway, so we started doing a lot of that, rolling after we planted. Just depend, depends on the situation. So we've done all this for three or four years, took a lot of analytical data. A lot of testing, soil tests, biological tests, infiltration rates. I mean, we lived in, in the 58 fields that we started out this study, all right? And everybody likes to take pictures. So anyways, I'm about done. I graphed it off. <laughs> there it is. All right? That's what we learned. Okay? All I can say about it, man, it's complicated. <laughs> it's complicated. It's never the same. All right? So... Anyways, but what is that? That's a wisdom graph. Okay? That's what we got. we got. We learned some wisdom out of this. Here's how we started out. Uh, another one of our house with tools. In the beginning, we planted some peas, clover, vegetables, cereal rye, and radish. Now we throw all that in, and then we plant all this. You know. So one thing we did do right is we never, we were never afraid of diversity from the start. Okay, we started out pretty diverse. Okay, and, I, and that's really jump start helped us. What I gained early on in this, our no-till is extremely bacterial dominated. What biology we got, it's out, of, it's out of balance. Winter weeds have been integral to our success. If it wasn't for that, what little bit of carbon that leaked through that hen bit and chickweed, no-till wouldn't have been as good as it was to us back in the day. Uh, and minus a lot of the erosion and a little bit of diesel, <coughs> it's very conventional tillage, just to be honest with you. Some things that I key indicators that I like to look at 
Infiltration is probably number one for me in our inherent souls. Conventional tillage is awful. No till across all these fields, across counties two to three inches. All right. After one year of covers, what you saw, that was a three year progression in our county. Okay? And here's what our infiltration rates have done. Four to six, four to eight, and five to twenty. At four inches, all of our wash is stopped in these fields. You know, all these no-till ruts, they stop. And infiltration rates, folks, are very dynamic, but the trends are static. Okay, conventional's always gonna suck. No-till's gonna be a little bit better. And the more we mimic nature, the better off, the better off they're gonna be under any condition. And why was the water going in the ground? This is that field in my house that I showed you there where we was plant rolling down in beans. That's where it started. Two years. Okay? Two years. Let's talk about temperature. That's a big driving deal. We get plenty of moisture usually. Anywhere from 56 to 84 inches is what it's been doing throughout this deal. All right? But when it gets above 95, everything's bad. Okay? I cannot control the temperature outside. But I can do a lot to do it in the soil, can't I? Look right here. The better job we do managing the covers, look at our temperatures. Yeah. Anyways, uh, but look, conventional till, 113, 110. Look where I'm starting to crimp cover, 85 degrees, 83 degrees. This is 92 degrees outside on June 24th. That's a pretty critical time for corn growing in our neck of the woods. Okay, also look at our infill, or our temperatures. All right, here's what the crops look like. That's Emory soil, that's the best they got in Tennessee. That's 250 bushel dry land. I mean, that's good stuff, okay? 92 degrees. I work for the government, so I can't afford no Emory. I've got a farm Dixon, 95 degrees. And I'm gonna go ahead and tell you, that cat is a lot better farmer than I am. But my soil was in a little better condition. And on that day, 95 degrees when I'm looking at my corn right there, it's all those brace roots. We wasn't in a drought, but we, we, we hadn't had a drink of water. And you see that stuff right there? I didn't know what it was at the time, so I went up there and I touched it. And guess what it felt like? Have you ever had like one of them snotty noses like it's running and you pull it out? I mean, you can't even sling that stuff off your fingers. <laughs> Slickest, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> and then when you get something like that, what's your next step you're going to do? You're going to eat it. <laughs> Anybody want to guess what it tastes like? Sweetest sweet tea you ever taste in your life. It's pure sugar. It's what's driving the system. All this testing, what's going on under, under our feet from a biological standpoint. The blue line's a one-day CO2 burst. After 30, 40 years of no-till, we was at about 50. After three years, <coughs> these systems we was on average of 350. This has crossed 58 fields and a couple thousand acres. Our water extractable carbon started out uh, up in here, nose dive, done this. I said, Rick, I don't like this. When I do something, I want it all to be looking the way I want it to look. Basically, we were restoring the population. We couldn't keep them fed enough, okay? So it started getting more linear the way you expect, the way we want it. This soil health calculation score thing, it started out at 12, it doubled. So we've done that in three years, okay? In a very good climate, in a good place where we ought to be able to do it, okay? Done some trial plot work where we was doing just you know university recommendations or whatever typically you do on, on fertility. And we've done that side by side with, with Haney recommendations, which was typically a nutrient reduc reduction as compared to what we were doing. Alright. Just in general, we was getting, you know, 170 some bushel corn with Haney's 125 recommendation. Then we get a bushel corn per unit of nitrogen following what we've always been doing, all right? And then the second year into that, reduced nitrogen a little bit, yields went up a little bit, and our typical way it stayed the same. What's all that mean to you? Well, here's what it means to me. Currently, you know, it takes a tremendous amount of organic cycling of nitrogen to be able to grow 200 
plus bushel corn with, with tremendous input reductions. But you know, our we got some soils cranking, but our factory's still pretty empty. Okay, we're still here. Here's what we're trying to build. That's what we got to have some workers. Take a look at beans. You know, don't have to have as much nitrogen cycling from a you know from a source. Man, we grow some pretty good beans with sunshine and water. Look up here. It's over two years. 82 bushel beans with no with nothing sunshine and water. 020 for 40, 84 bushel. Well, that's better. But look over here. And this is 280, 280 acre farm, and this this handy plot was about 20 acres of it. But the whole farm averaged 94 bushels the second year we ran this. But I still made 89 bushels with nothing. That's still pretty good. Okay. Oh, and it's not just me. Uh, what was formerly Security Seed and Chemical, they do all their trial plots in biomass now. I think they've been bought out by Nutrient. But, you know, they see this. This is the way our folks farm. So this is why they're doing their trials, matching these hybrids. Very important. You see, they average 215 bushel corn across all their trial stuff. Highest trials in the county. All the other seed suppliers are doing no-till trials. We smoke them. Input reductions. This is, according to me, what we've done. I'm not saying this is right or wrong. This is what we've done. Nitrogen's the last for us to go, okay, in, our, in what we're doing. NPK ain't the only inputs on the farm, folks. Our savings early on in these systems have came from reduced spray trips. Not only reduced spray trips, being able to control the weeds that we're trying to kill anyways, okay? What I gain up to this, uh, it, it really changes stuff when you get moisture in your soil, big time. And I'm not going to go through all these, but I am going to say that I could care less about organic matter percentage, okay? And I know this sounds different. I mean, all these, you know, soils I'm talking about, they're 1.8 to 2.2 percent organic matter. Pretty low, you, You'd think that we should uh, be having stuff. That holy grail fields, 2.2 percent. I'm more concerned of flow of energy, flow of carbon, flow of feed in the system than I am labile organic matter. Now don't get me wrong, I'd like to have both. I'd like to have a big house with a lot of feed in it. But right now, it's more important to me to concentrate on granny cooking three or four squares a day in that little house, okay? This will happen to you, all right? <laughs> I mean, it's for true. Look at Thompson right here. And, 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 and if you see a soil health person and they got a head full of hair, you got to have questions. They're not a soil health farmer. They're not a regenerative farmer. They are ranchers. Okay. <laughs> but uh, anyways, you know, so just have to throw that in there a little bit. But this is going to happen. But I ain't too worried about it. Uh, I believe in these systems. Things was going easy. They got tough, and then we really started learning what we was doing. All right, folks, we can build this resiliency, but we can lose it real slow or real fast. It takes a while to build it. This is all just side by side by side right there when we run a field day. This is a crimp biomass infiltration rate was 34 inches. We terminated some of the cover for a demo, about yay tall, knee tall, six inches. That field right next to it, just like for me to Mr. Keith right here, two and a quarter inches. Then we took where we got this 34 inch infiltration and we run one tillage pass through it. Not full, not real tillage, just recreational tillage, okay? <laughs> I took it from 34 to two inches. Why? When it's the surface seals function ceases, okay? Or the ability to function ceases. Everything we're gonna do has an effect on this system. We talked a little bit here in a little bit of more drier neck of the woods. It requires moisture to grow covers. You cannot conserve moisture without <coughs> covers. All right. What do we really have the ability to manage? Can we make it rain or can we control what the rains we get? You know, and why pray for rain when we ain't made no place for it to fall? And where does fall up? mimic any natural principle. Just think about where that, why that, where, what, what does it mimic? And if you don't believe me or don't believe myself, 
Take advice from a nine-year-old. Dad, it won't work. Won't work in Tennessee. Won't work in Kansas. Won't work nowhere. The sun has, we have to absorb sunlight to feed the system. Now, we think about it a lot just for droughts. That's a no-brainer, okay? But here's what I see in my neck of the woods. When no-till and conventional is too heavy, guess what we're doing? We're planting. Then everything's good. Guess what we're still doing? We're planting. And then when it gets too, high, too hard and dry, and we can't get the no-till planters in, and the conventional boys are really fussing, thinking about they're going to go build a seed bed, guess what we're doing? We're planting. <laughs> Not only is our logistical window wider for planting, but think about stuff growing during all these conditions. I'm not saying it's not dry, but it's better off than what the no-till or the conventional system is, right? I'm not saying it's not mud hole wet, but what are we managing better in these systems? And we can do it in the wet times, the good times, and the dry times, okay? And that, that takes care of all the times, all right? Here's what happens. There's four seasons in this cover. You know, cuss them in the fall, cuss them in the winter. You know, really cuss them because you've got to plant them in the spring. All right? And then you're going to praise them in the summer. Let's look at Matlock Farms here. Uh, asked me to share just a little bit of economics on some stuff. A couple thousand acres. You're around stalkers, corn and beans, covers. Been doing this for about five years. It's got three years of biomass. Not seen any yield decrease. What he likes about it, and I'm gonna have to hurry, folks, and I apologize. Uh, you know, fields are ready to plant, not just portions of them. The good ground's getting better, or the, the poor ground is getting better. Uh, his good ground's getting better. Erosion's an afterthought, all right? He can get in on these fields on wetter times. He's got grazing options. We can control Palmer. That's what he likes. What he don't like, it's a logistical nightmare. All right, when you're farming 2,500 acres and it's you and you got one helper and you got a thousand cows. All right, eight slugs, ain't got enough fences. Here's what's the start of his 18 corn crop. 1,200 acres of this. This is what it all went in looking like. He'd come in, uh, plant it. Uh, one pass system, it's got yetter stalk devastators on it. Come back in, burn it down. Uh, nitrogen management, where he follow her up with that. That was, he done 1,200 acres like that in 18, it averaged 223 bushel dry land corn across, across the board. Pretty good corn, all right? Here's what I really like, one farm. Look at that sign we got. Old farm averaged like 200, over 260 bushel, okay? That, that's not one of them little honey holes, all right? That's, that's just driving on down through there picking big corn, all right? He bought this farm five years ago. We bought it, we couldn't plant in these green areas, okay? Stayed too wet. He still paid the same amount for it. They didn't discount the price because they had gar holes, all right? But what happened now, we plant the whole farm, all right? It's not because we're increasing the infiltration rate down here in these wet holes. It's because now the water, we're not recharging the same. So in 18, he, he was able to buy this farm. It had been conventionally tilled. He had a he tillage event to get everything lined up, smoothed up. Had to do a replant on this. Came a big rain, sealed off. Had to replant 40 acres. All this right here, 30 bushel an acre off of this right here, with less labor, less. So you know, I, I'm not real good at economics. This and right here, fat the bill fold more than that did. Okay. When we started that with him here on his home farm, 100 acres of row crop, 100 acres of grass, over a three year period when we paid attention to this, he averaged 247 bushel corn, 82 bushel beans, and all these crop fields, this 100, he averaged 700, 800 pounds of gain on cattle per acre. So that's gain per acre, all right? They could have just been sitting out there, right, being cover crops, and still went into biomass. So that's a pretty good, how many of you should like to have an extra eight, nine hundred dollars an acre income coming in? Now he can't do this on everything, he don't do it on everything, but that just shows the potential and the power, okay? And then at times we just put three to four hundred pounds on the cattle and still grow 80 to 100 bushel a week the first year we started, but that's, we was losing money doing that, okay? There's a picture of the little video of the planter, 
showing how we made that. Big time logistical savings, one pass for him. Okay, there it is running. Makes a real nice mat, does a good job. All right. Then, on the way out here, he came out here with me last year, he said, I'd plant cotton this year. And they're planting cotton for in his life. He thought about 800 acres would be a good place to start. <laughs> All right. And that's what, he, that's what, that's the start of his cotton. That's what he's going into that. I was scared to that. All right. So, there it was. I'll be darned. It said hello to the world. It's looking promising. And at the end of the day, had four bells staring us in the face. Okay, pretty good, pretty good. It's a good little ride out here. We have focused on maximizing the efficiency of these applied nutrients prior to looking at reductions. Not only looking at maximizing the efficiency, I really try to look at reducing salt load. That's probably my first reduction is reducing salts. There's a lot of different formulations out there that is a, that is a lot less salt load. I don't think... You can't starve a profit out of a gar hole by reducing inputs. I think you got to prime the, you got to build it first before you ever take a chance on making these big time reductions. I am not a cold turkey feller. Okay, I just I ain't in it. I ain't got no farmers that would do it with me if I wanted to. So my workload would be pretty low. All right, but here's what I do like to try to do. We got a lot of tools out there. They all got a place. I like to try to look at all of it and make a decision. I don't like to guess no more than I have to. I'm gonna guess enough of the weather. I'm gonna guess enough of everything else. Don't don't guess at things you ain't got to. Willis Farms, a little bigger row crop, bunch of cattle, wants every acre profitable. Uh, it was a hard sale. This is this is top notch no tiller in my neck of the woods. He had her going on. All right. Here they are planting beans. This is in one of our megs, been sprayed about two days prior. That's pretty simple, okay? It's pretty simple growing beans. May have to come back with a post, just depends, but we've got a lot of acres of that. The next time you see that field, we got a, got a combine in it, okay? Now you don't need to roll on that. That 500 T is doing plenty of good job. What I want you to really look at right here, he's got 400 acres of some real strong ground that he puts in a wheat rotation. It makes him some money. He's got about 1,400 acres of marginal ground that we're doing covers on, and about 1,200 acres of some marginal ground that he's not able to do covers on. Look at the difference comparing those two apples and that profit per acre. Okay, he's eliminated atrazine. Look at the net profit we're able to graze these covers, okay? Why do these cows do good on covers? Look at our cover crop diverse mixes, relative feed quality, and compared to high quality hay. That's pretty good chow right there, ain't it? All right, some main factors affecting the how. Okay, I realize this. I realize that I am a spoiled brat where we farm, okay? I'll admit it. But we got these main factors. You got latitude, precipitation, and then you put the two together. It makes it even tougher, right? Let's think about how some of these folks are doing it. I mean, his next door neighbor's Santa Claus. <laughs> All right. I mean, what's weathers? You get a chance to listen to him. Poor Jimmy down here. See, I mean, it's either on fire, it's flooded, it's dry. I mean, think about think about all the house that they went through. I mean, think about it. You know, Lauren, he's so confused, he just wears shorts all the time. <laughs> all right. Think about Mr. Brandt right here, one of the pioneers in this. Think, think about how, where he sits in it. And then, of course, these guys here, they don't do it. They ought to have a kick up the tail. <coughs> Want to highlight up something else? Uh, Bolo Farms, Northeast. And I've talked to Lauren a lot, but he always said something that just really, you know, every time... Every once in a while, someone will stick with you, somebody says. And adaptation is a word that's really stuck with me, okay? I think when we fail, we try to adopt versus adapt, okay? You know, just look at some of the things that's going on in his neck of the woods. Why does the corn interceded? You know, I'm sure in 17, he was planning on this clover being ready for 19 corn crop. No, he just hit a home run and adapted to it, right? 
And then, you know, you got all major food groups right here. You got barley and soybean burgers. So, I mean, that'll feed the world right there in one pass. <laughs> all right? Same thing. If you don't like the barley, you can have a little rye mixed in with the diet. All right? We're looking at the three lakes. Folks, these systems are going to beat the tails off anything else. We wouldn't be having these conferences talking about it if it wasn't. And what's the key? Bugs and carbon and sunshine. All right? And the moral of this is, if you're going to kill somebody, you don't bury them in a no-till field. <laughs> All right? Look at this old euphorism right here. I think this kind of ties into me finishing up a little bit. Folks, there is nothing wrong with data. Nothing wrong with it. Get all of it you can. But it's how you start stacking it and piling it. All right? The goal is to get a little bit of wisdom. Wisdom leads to dynamics in our thought process, dynamics in our management. Okay? So, don't farm data. Try to gain systematic wisdom. Because education is important, but wisdom's important. Y'all <laughs> so, want that? Okay. And if you'll notice, that ain't even got a red line under it. I spelled it right the first time. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> Folks, don't get your hows before you wise. I think it'll make you crash. I think if you understand your hows or your wise first, It'll be a lot better. Kind of a morbid way to end a talk. My old buddy Tick got killed at an early age. And I know that's a beautiful rock. He like chasing old turkeys and noodle for catfish. But we don't ever pay no attention to that little dash right there between them dates, do we? That's the important part. Y'all won't die. But you live it now. We got a chance. Make the most out of that dash. Okay? It has been an honor, as always. Thank you all for having me.